Hello everybody. So now that we're getting out of oceans, I want to get into wetlands and uh, we'll spend some time thinking about uh, wetland ecology and then also different types of wetlands. So, you know, previous to the 1950s, essentially, what we thought of is wetlands are, you know, whatever this guy's face tells you, right? It's a terrible place with bug infested, disease ridden mosquitoes, ponds that do nothing for us, right? And federal policy was drain them, fill them up, get rid of wetlands so we can actually do something on them. Um, so farmers would bulldoze them, put drain tile in to drain them, farm right up next to them or if not through them. And what we see is wetlands went down in huge numbers. So states just south of us lost between 80 to 100 percent because um, this is where, you know, the breadbasket of our country, right, where we're growing a lot of corn and a lot of, um, of food for us. So uh, Wisconsin, not so bad, but, you know, basically we don't have as many people here in these, these greener states. Um, and we didn't lose as, but we still lost about half of our wetlands, right? Not as much. What we see is that uh, wetland losses have really declined, um, but we're still losing them in um, right now, um, even though we have laws against that. Uh, so Louisiana is a great example where a lot of the shoreline wetlands along here are being drained, developed, or just natural causes. So a hurricane comes through and wipes out, floods over. Um, shoreline areas that are that are like swamps and or bayous and totally um, get reclaimed by the ocean. Um, so if we look at you know right now where we're at for um, uh, how much land is being lost in Louisiana there's a lot of um, land that is being lost each year to um, uh, of wetland area that is being lost. So we see that there was this kind of changing perspective though. In 1950s, 1960s, people are realizing, oh, where are all our ducks? Well, you just got rid of all the places where the ducks go. Not surprising, you're not gonna have any more ducks now, right? Uh, wetland areas are huge um, sources of biodiversity for the region. And we see so, so many um, organisms using this. Uh, either things that transient things that are coming in and out like ducks or just the, the plants and animals that are inhabiting the, the wetlands to begin with. Um, so we see a variety of different um, laws that came about. The Clean Water Act in the 70s, farm bills um, were kind of, uh, we usually think of as, you know, helping out farmers, but a lot of the, the farm uh, laws have gone in to try to protect, to give farmers uh, benefit in some area, but try to protect wetlands in other areas. Generally what we see is that the U.S. and Canada is in a no net loss policy, so they don't want to lose wetlands, but that's not really true because we're all the time paving over get ridding, getting rid of natural wetlands to create wetlands in other places, which don't have a lot of the same services that a natural wetland would have. So a lot of um, actually policy has gone in to try to define what a wetland is. Because if we have to not have a loss of wetland, we need to be able to define where a wetland is and what is and what isn't a wetland. So these are distinct ecosystems, but highly connected to the upland system. So a wetland boundary is really, you know, that it's just a upland to, you know, aquatic, system, there, it's just a continuum, right? There's not a line, but, so there's an arbitrary line, but it's scientifically defensible. So it's really kind of tricky to determine what is and what isn't a wetland. But uh, the way we define a wetland is in a three-part definition. Hydrology, hydric soils, and wetland vegetation. So hydrology, what does that mean? Is there actually water there? Hydric soils are the soils developed under saturated conditions and wetland vegetation. Do we find uh, plants that are um, that only grow in saturated soil conditions? 
So let's go through these. Hydrology. Now this is a very specific definition where we find inundation or saturation. So it doesn't necessarily mean to have visible water, but you can have saturation of soil within 18 inches of the soil surface for at least seven or more growing days. Okay? Growing days meaning seven days in the growing season. So if you have, you know, every year the winter has some water pooling during the winter and it might be in you know like Texas or something where they don't really have a real winter but uh, it's not during the growing season so that wouldn't necessarily count but um, it's basically is there water there for a little bit during the growing season if it does that matches the, the then then that matches the definition of wetland we have a wetland hydric soils Hydric soils are soils that are developed under anoxic conditions associated with saturation. We get these really dark gray colors. Um, this gray color here is actually called glade, G-L-E-Y-E-D. Um, that's the type of soil that, that is created. And um, oh, we'll, we'll hit on that in a second. But then we also get um, plants so, so for a wetland to be a wetland, it needs to have wetland plants. It supports plants that grow under saturated conditions. And there's a variety of different plants that do this. Um, basically, we have a giant database of all the plants that we grow in a wetland and outside of a wetland. And, you know, what we're talking about is all sorts of different um, types of plants, truly submergent plants that are growing underwater, ones that are floating in leaves like lily pads or emergent uh, plants, also free floating plants like duckweed, like you have here. But the soil saturation is uh, really interesting because what it does is it really eliminates oxygen in the soil. Once, because, because, okay, so think about a dry soil. There's particles of soil and air spaces in between them, and oxygen can come from the surface into the into the, the the soil. This is why worms are good, right? Worms make these little pathways and allow oxygen into the soil through their little tunnels. Um, but if all of those tunnels and all of that um, that dirt, all the spaces in between the dirt, are continuously saturated with water, or saturated with water for just a little bit each year, what we get is this anoxic condition where the soils then um, that they don't have any oxygen and you get a continuous leach out of nutrients. Um, so like iron will be leached out and that's why you get this gray color. And um, these little um, rusty spots in here due to plant roots that are bringing oxygen down, um, making that iron available. But you get a lot of accumulation of nitrous and sulfurous compounds. That's why when you step in a wetland and like that muck and you get that rotten egg smell, that's the hydrogen sulfide. Um, that's coming out, that's being created in that anoxic environment. But this, uh, so when you go back here to the definition of a wetland, you need to have all three of these parts. So where you have hydrology, so where you have water, where you have hydric soils, where you have wetland vegetation, boom, you have a wetland, okay? And you need to match all three of those things. And so then you can define in a map where those wetlands are. That's called wetland delineation. And people really are looking for wetland delineators because it's um, a pretty tough thing to do. You need to know a lot of things about plants, you need to know a lot of things about soil, and you need to know a lot of things about water to be able to define where a wetland is. And so developers really want to know because they uh, don't want to be um, paving over wetlands, or if they do, they need to get special permission to be able to destroy a given wetland to create X amount of artificial wetland in another place. And usually what that is, is they have to create like five times the amount of, of artificial wetland, but realistically those things are nowhere near as, um, as useful as normal natural wetlands. But so uh, I really want to talk about plants and how they grow then in these wetlands. Because um, if the soil itself is free of oxygen, that's not a good thing for the roots that are within that soil, right? Those roots need oxygen to be able to respire, right? Those roots are still growing, using sugars, going through 
um, cellular respiration, so they need oxygen to be able to um, grow and survive. So what we see is uh, if you take a cattail, uh, this is a cattail that's been cut in cross-section, um, you see all of these really big open passageways. And that's so oxygen can flow through down in through their stems into the roots of the plant. Um, this is a lotus root. It's basically like a type of uh, lily pad kind of thing found in Asia. And they have um, these huge air spaces. This is also it. Um, huge air spaces that allow oxygen in to uh, very quickly get to the roots of the plant way down deep in those anoxic soils. Um, uh, buttressed trees are also very common. So these are cypress trees down in the southeastern United States where we have, oops, sorry, um, <coughs> where we have these uh, kind of like more, it, what it does is it stabilizes the tree. So the tr tree can grow 100 feet tall even though it's in really unstable mud, it's got a wider base. Kind of think of it like the Eiffel Tower. Uh, one of the really interesting chemical thing is that nitrogen in wetlands is really limiting. It's reduced to ammonium, which is toxic to them. So they need to convert it to nitrate, um, LR fine nitrogen in other ways. So we see a lot of really weird adaptations, sundews, Venus flytraps, um, pitcher plants that can get nitrogen use, uh, used for them and um, they'll get their nitrogen from uh, animal sources and basically insects that are uh, flying around and landing on them. Another really interesting thing that we see is that um, plants have interesting reproductive strategies in wetlands where they um, generally need to time their reproduction so that the seeds can germinate in the dry season. Seeds don't do well when they're very like super wet. Um, so you see a lot of floating seeds and fruits. Uh, we talked about the the, this is uh, a viviparous um, mangrove. So mangroves are a type of wetland, right? Just coastal wetland. Um, and they, um, the seeds germinate actually on the tree before they drop into the water. Another thing that we see is long-term seed viability. So seeds last a really long time. Um, cypress trees, the seeds can be viable even though when they've dropped and been you know, sitting in the bottom of wetland for 20 years. Um, they'll sit at the bottom of wetland they'll, and wait for a dry period. They'll get a dry period where the, you know, the, um, the swamp has drawn down in water level and then they'll be able to grow and um, start a baby little tree. The problem is so many of these swamps in the southeastern U.S. are regulated for navigation so um, and for flood maintenance so they never really get any dry periods anymore so what we see is a lot of the uh, cypress forests in the US in the southeastern US right now are all old trees and uh, no no baby trees are growing because we don't let the wetlands themselves dry out um, at certain times um, so it's it's quickly going to become a problem as these trees get um, old and start dying out. All right, that's it for uh, uh, the beginning of wetlands. We'll come back and look at wetland types in the next lecture.